2 Chronicles chapter 1 and verse 7, our message is entitled, A Better Why. A Better Why. W-H-Y, just to clarify that. Verse 7, that night God appeared to Solomon and he asked, what do you want? Ask and I will give it to you. Who'd like that opportunity? Solomon replied to the Lord, the, to God, you have shown great and faithful love to David, my father, and now you have made me king in his place. O oh Lord God, please continue to keep your promise to David, my father, for you have made me king over a people that is so numerous. They are like the dust of the earth. Give me the wisdom and knowledge to lead them properly. For who could possibly govern this great people of yours? He's saying, I've got a really hard job. Verse 11, God said to Solomon, because your greatest desire is to help your people, because your greatest desire is to help your people, and you did not ask for wealth or riches or fame or even the death of your enemies. I'd like to pray that some days. Or a long life. Who's with me? Come on, somebody. Don't look, don't look too Christian at me. But rather you have asked for wisdom and knowledge to properly govern my people. I will certainly give you the wisdom and knowledge you requested, but I will also give you wealth, riches, and fame, such as no other king has had before you or will ever have in the future. What an amazing passage of Scripture. You know, guys, if we're going to understand life correctly, then I think one of the most important things we've got to understand about life is that at the end of the day, everything, everything, it all comes back to the why. Why? The most important thing in everything is why. Now, this is not easy for us. Some people think, oh, that's automatic, John. But the truth is, your life is full of a lot of what. What are you doing today? What are you going to wear today? And then chucking aware, and we're going crazy. Where are you going? And then where after that? And what's the purpose? And there can be a lot of what's that fill up our minds, our hearts, our activities. Come on, especially if you're involved in any form of family. It's just a lot of what. And the danger of that is that we end up so busy and so full of all of the what we need to do and what needs to be completed and what we're going to get over the line and what we're going to wear and what we're going to eat that we forget the why. And when the why is lost, everything about life tumbles down. Because when it comes to life, it is so true. Come on, who knows this? That when you've lost your why, you've lost your way. When you lose your why, you lose your way. If you want to, we want to get off track in family. If we want to get off track in our marriage, we want to get off track in our career. And certainly just just from the, the great decisions of life down to the minutia, the clearer your why, the clearer your way. The better your why, the better your way. The better your why, the more higher you're likely to go in life. And the worse your why, the lower you're likely to go in life. Come on, am I talking to any Christians this morning? Everything about the quality of our lives, how we're doing in life is going to come back to our why. And in our day and age, this is not easy because we live in a ridiculously self-centered world. This is not true. With the maxim of like why you can do anything that you want to do. When people, when people can find a reason for just about anything under this justification, it makes me happy. Because it makes me happy. It's a good thing to do. Why are you attacking that person with a knife? It makes me happy. I mean, maybe people would get off with that one, you know, jump off, say, no, that's wrong. But just about anything else, right? You can give up on relationships. You can radically change your career. You can pierce everything. You can do what you want. You can pretty much remake over yourself and your life and everything and walk away from just about anything as long as it fits within that maxim. It is making me happy because it makes me happy. Do you remember the song? If it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. I can't sing anymore, but in another life, maybe. I was looking at Shahan like somehow if I looked at Shahan, it would magically happen. That the, It didn't work. You failed me, bro. 
If it makes you happy, it's such a lousy why. It is. It's a really lousy why because it's so short term. I mean, today you like crunchy peanut butter, so you're getting, you know, why are you eating crunchy? Because I like crunchy. Well, you know, it's not good enough. It's not like, I mean, it just doesn't work. When, when your why is happiness, you're setting yourself up for, for short term gains followed by a lot of heartache. If, if your why is happiness, then you might go after something in a moment that you're going to regret for a lifetime. If, you're, if your why is that it's just making you happy, then you're almost guaranteed to fail at some point in that journey. And the truth is, I think as a culture, as a culture, we need a better why. We need a reason for nobility again. We need a reason for sacrifice again. We need a reason for, for aiming for something greater. We need a deeper sense of motivation. I just think as, as, as people, we need to make sure that we're getting always in our lives a better why. I've just closed out 25 years of full-time Christian ministry. I, t- I started when I was eight. I, I didn't. I, I started when I was... I started full-time when I was 19. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm breathing some thin oxygen in that. I've got a shot by the age of 69. I could, as long as I don't blow this thing, I could do 50 years. Not many people get that opportunity. So it's a pretty cool opportunity. It's, it's kind of like my goal. And then I'm, I'm out. I want to retire and relax and not have it so hectic. But... but uh, but for the next 25 years, I'm just so aware that it's not going to be easier. Because every year that you get in the journey of life, it's just so much easier to, to, to look at the struggle, right? Look at the challenge. Look at the price of moving and just check out on that journey. So when I was on holiday in, in April, I sat down. That was the month that I, I, I completed the 25. And so I sat down that holiday and I thought, John, you've got to come up with some reasons some thoughts around why you're doing what you're doing. You need, you need a bigger why than the temptation to lower your goal. You need a bigger reason than just that, 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 that drift of life that wants to just settle with what it's got. You need, a, you need a bigger motivation than the challenges that are gonna come in front of you. Because friends, if we're not careful, we allow our why just to diminish in life. And whenever our why gets smaller, our lives get smaller. And whenever we lose our why, we've already lost our way. When you lose your way, you begin to make really bad decisions. And so when it comes to life, I think it's really essential. It's it's hugely important that each and every one of us comes back to a very clear and a very specific and an easy to answer why? Why? Because what we learn from our passage of Scripture this morning is that God is clearly interested in the why. I mean, God loved David, King David. And when Solomon became king in his place, the Bible tells us that God, because he loved David, turns up to Solomon and he's like, I so loved your dad, I just want to do anything for you. What do you want? He asked this young king, and listen, you know, let's get it real, man. If you've, if you've been king for a day, you've already got problems, right? I mean, with parents, come on, just to get here, you had problems. And here, here is the king over a country. That is just a job title that just says problems to me. He's got people who want to kill him. He's got an agricultural climate that's not guaranteed. He's in the Middle East. He's got, he's got you know, an army. He's got, he's got, chal- he's got wives. He's got challenges, right? And here, God turns up in his life and he says, what do you want? Ask anything and I'm going to give it to you. If he had asked for wealth, God would have given it. If he had asked for long life, God would have given it. Fame, God would have given it. Yet Solomon said to God in this moment, he said, the people are amazing and they're so numerous and I feel so underqualified for the job that you've called me to do. Would you give me wisdom? And God said, wow, the reason for what you asked for, is what gets my attention. The why in your what, the why in your request is literally gonna cause me to not only give you what you're asking for, but everything you didn't ask for as well. I'm gonna give you wealth, I'm gonna give you fame, I'm gonna kill off your enemies, and I'm gonna give you a long life. That's amazing. And God said, the reason why I'm going to give all of that to you is because Solomon, you had a better why. God is interested in why. And the right why is going to bring God's blessing. 
We're here to talk about family today, but let me, just, let me just make sure we're pivoting this centrally to this environment. Listen, if there's a great why for our family, then that family is gonna get heaven's blessing. God said, because your why, Solomon, is so amazing, I'm gonna bless you, I'm gonna bless your life, I'm gonna abundantly shatter you, even with what you didn't ask for, because your why is flat out amazing. Not only that, but we discover from the scripture that if you've got a bad why, then heaven just removes itself. In James chapter four, verses two and three, the Bible says you want something, but you don't get what you want. You quarrel and fight, but you still don't get what you desire. And then you ask for it, and even when you ask for it, I don't give it to you. In verse three of James four, we learn why God doesn't give it. He says, when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. What's God saying? He said, I know it's ouch, but just I'm preaching to the person next to you, not you. He's literally saying, because your why sucks, you ask me for something and I'm not gonna grant it. If you'd get a better why, you'd get more prayers answered. If you'd get a better why, then heaven will be responsive to what you are requesting. Everything comes back to, shout it out, why? So if we wanna have the kind of life, if we wanna have the kind of family, if we want to have the kind of marriage that we're really asking for, if we, and normally the what of that is we want a peace-filled marriage, we want everybody to be awesome, we want the kids to love and respect us, we want a wife who's making us breakfast in bed every day, we want, girls want a husband who's just romantic, always, flowers every day, like we just, if we're going to get the, we, we've got a lot of what, but the real thing that God comes to us, He, do, he doesn't even look so much at your what, at your wish list or your dream thing of what perfection's all about. God's looking at whatever we're asking for and what He's thinking about is why? Why? Why do you want that? Why do you desire that? Because everything comes back to why. And it's just so easy to lose your why. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? And in family, the most important thing about everything. In marriage, the most important thing in everything. Listen, in every area of life, the most important thing in everything is why. And if we wanna build great families, we wanna build great marriages, listen, every single person, if you wanna one day have a great marriage or a great family, then let, just, let me just ask you something, why? If, if you're single out there, you wanna get married, why? If you're married out there and you, 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 know, you, wanna, you wanna have those children more obedient, why? If you're out there and you'd really like your spouse to be different than they are today, then why? Because everything in our lives is gonna be impacted by why, why, why? When my daughter Lara, who praise God, is in the children's program as a leader this morning, and can I ask every teenager not to tell her about this section because it will cost me money. But when Lara was three years old, I'll never forget, Jillian went away on a ministry trip and I was you know, in charge of not only preaching and running the church, but also making sure that this three-year-old made it to church and home again alive. And I remember on the Saturday night, I put her in bed about seven o'clock and then once she was asleep, I, I thought, man, if I'm gonna take her to church in the morning, then I better plan out what she's going to wear. And if you know anything about me, you'd know that I care about this stuff. And so, so I, had, I had this outfit all picked out. I had matching shoes. I had a beautiful dress. I'm like, yeah, we'll put a ribbon. I don't know. I, I can't do hair. But anyway, I was like, we're gonna, we're gonna get this thing looking great. We're gonna have this girl looking amazing. People are gonna look at me. Have you ever met those Instagram parents where their kids are always in trendy clothes? I hate those parents. Like, uh, my kids have never looked like this. Like, ah, you know, perfectness. And I'm like, never, never happens to me. This doesn't work. And, and I've got this outfit out for Lara. I'm like, you are going to be an Instagram child. This is going to be incredible. I wake up the next morning. I'm like, okay, Lara, let's get you ready for church. And, and we're starting to get ready. And she, she has this princess dress that she loves. Now, if you have preschool children, you need to get with me right now. She has a princess dress that she loves. Now, when I say loves, I am saying loves. Like she wears this thing every day. She has worn it for so long. It has like frayed edges at the bottom. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? She has stains from all different food groups down the front of the princess dress. Come on, it's, it's the middle of winter. I discreetly remember it being freezing outside and it has no thermal properties at all. Come on, any parents know what I'm talking about? You know that dress? Yeah, the one you quietly just throw in the rubbish bin when they're not looking. That dress. And as we're starting to get ready, Lara grabs that 
dress and she's like I want to wear this dress to church and she's three years old you know and I'm like no darling I've got this great outfit for you and she's like no I want to wear this I'm like darling look at this outfit your daddy has laid out for you and she's like I want to wear the princess dress and next thing you know on a Sunday morning before I minister God's word I'm having a full blown row with a three-year-old and victory for me does not look anywhere on the horizon. If you're a parent and no, just give me a wave. Yeah, thank you. Or you non-parents, you just are so judgmental because you haven't lived here yet. <laughs> I remember, well, I just, in the, we're just, we're at, we're at loggerheads and I walked out of the room and I'm praying. I'm like, God, you've got to help me get this girl to do what I want. You got to. <laughs> I love the fact that parents were already laughing. Because you knew my prayer was never going to get answered. <laughs> I'm like, God, you got to help me. i got to get this girl to obey me. You know, I'm going to preach God's word. Surely I can get obedience in the heart of a three-year-old. <laughs> help me to get this girl to, to wear this clothing. God, 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 help me. And God's like, why? <laughs> and I'm like, God, because i got to get it. And he's like, no, no, no. Why, John? Why? And suddenly one of those rare moments of honesty, I found myself saying to God, because if she dresses like this, I'll be embarrassed that she is wearing a tattered and broken, you know, princess outfit with no thermal qualities in the middle of a winter storm. I just felt like God was just saying to me, that's a pretty lousy why, isn't it? Like, and from that moment to this, I've, I've just had to like, I get a little twitch sometimes with some of the things I mean. Not now she's a teenager, she's amazing, but you know, sometimes like the kids walk out the door and they're wearing things and you're just like, I really hate what you're wearing, but God bless you because it's your life and your decision. Come on, parents, get with me. Come on, don't leave me alone. Don't leave me alone with this. And I, I just realized in that moment that if I was going to start to ask these children for their compliance, I needed a better why. Lots of single people out there are like, John, I'd really love to get married. And I'm, honestly, I'm like, why? <laughs> it's hard work, man. I mean, I was at like a 40th wedding anniversary the, the, the while ago, and a rather sarcastic husband. He loves his wife, but he was rather sarcastic. And I'm like, congratulations, man, 40 years. And he goes, yeah, surely that's enough, right? Like, you know, like... <laughs> So take this out of context, but honestly, single people, why? Why do you want to get married? Now, see, I'm serious, why? Because I'm lonely. Well, getting married isn't going to make you less lonely. Yeah. Fix you. That, be a better you before you mess up somebody else's life. You know? <laughs> Come on, get a better why. Get a better why. No, I just, I just want to finally be able to have sex. <laughs> just because you're married. <laughs> I'm not speaking personally, I've just heard talk. <laughs> you just flat out need a better why, man. I remember when Gillian and I were dating, I, I, I really took this seriously, far too seriously, actually. My pastor sat me down and said, John, stop praying about your marriage, right? If you like this girl, I like her, your parents like her, just, if this is the right one, just go for it. Stop being so spiritual. But before my pastor gave me that advice, I, I was praying. I was like, God, is this the girl that I should marry? And I remember one night I had a dream. And in this dream, I was washing Jillian's feet. Pause. I hate feet. Flat out, hate feet. Hate. Hate is not too strong for this. <laughs> Keep your feet away from me. And I... I was washing Jillian's feet and I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me. And this is what the Holy Spirit said, don't put out the Spirit's fire. And I knew that God was saying to me, He's saying, you're gonna, you're gonna be a servant leader. You're gonna be a servant leader in this family. And this woman has been given a deposit of God's fire in her life. And if you put it out by the way that you handle her, then heaven is going to have a problem with that. And I knew right then that this was the girl that I was going to marry. One of 14 times where I knew that. But anyway, I knew that this was the girl that I was going to marry because in that moment, I got a better why. A lot of married people are out there today. And what you really like is for your spouse to change. You'd love them to change, 
right? You'd like them to get better at this, get better at that, stop doing this, stop doing that, seat down, more flowers, you know, uh, just stop asking me questions, let me watch the box. I don't know, whatever it is, we got a lot of stuff and we're hoping that our spouse is going to change. Let me just ask you a question about all of the what, why? About all of the change you'd like to see, why? Because if there's not a good why, let me ask you a more pertinent question about your marriage. Why are you married? Because if this, is, if this marriage has lost its why, it's lost its way. And the smartest thing we could do to turn this relationship around is not get increasingly frustrated with all of the what that we don't like, but to come back and ask one, one pulse rate increasing, one one optimism lifting one, one I'm going to get through this dark moment thing. And if you could just rekindle in your relationship, why? And if you found yourself in a marriage and it doesn't have a why, if you just kind of stumbled your way into it biologically and just suddenly you're there and you're in a marriage and now you're stuck with it and you're like, why am I even here? This is what I want you to know. We serve the God of why. And if you don't have a purpose for your marriage, I can tell you the God who does. If you haven't got a purpose for your life, I can point you to the Creator who does. The giver of life, the God who said, I've got a plan for you. There is a reason why you are here, a reason why you're in this marriage. You don't need to check out on the what, you need to rediscover the why. Come on, somebody say amen. We serve the God who's always got a why, always got a why. Listen, parents, parents, if you're here today and you're like, I would just like my kids to be more obedient. <laughs> well, that's just a given. <laughs> Every parent wants that. The real question is not what do you want from your kids, it's why. Why do you want that? Is it just so that your life can be easier? What a terrible why, what a terrible why. We need a far more deeper reason than just if they obeyed me more, I would enjoy less stress. That's a very mediocre why. My mom and dad weren't raised in Christian families. In fact, they both became Christians just before they got married. And so raising kids for them as Christians was like a double whammy. Now we're married and we have to be Christian married people. Now we've become parents and we have to be Christian parents. And they didn't know what that meant. So they were very prayerful, very prayerful. God, would you show us what it means to be Christian parents. And one day my dad was reading the Bible. And as he was reading the Bible, he discovered a passage of Scripture where Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees about taxation. If you think God can speak to you through accounting, then here it is right here, people. <laughs> and in the middle of this conversation, Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees and they're, they're, saying, they're saying, should we pay taxes to Rome? So he said, bring me a Roman coin. So they bought a Roman coin, and as my dad's reading it, Jesus asked a question about the coin. He said, whose image does the coin bear? And they said, well, the, the image on the coin is Caesar's image. He said, well, then you give to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and you give to God that which is God's. And as my father read that verse, he said to me, it was like the earth stopped spinning. Like there was no, no distraction. These words jumped off the page as he felt God say into his heart that day, if your children hold the image of God, then give to Caesar that which is Caesar's and you give to God that which is God's. And it changed my dad's life, changed the way my parents parented as they realized that these kids were not just little souls that needed to be more compliant, but they were an entrustment that had been given to them only for a season of time by God and that they belonged to God and they had to be returned to God. And he said, for me, it was like it just changed the game because from that moment forward, I wasn't just trying to get them to obey me. I was preparing them to obey God. I wasn't just trying to raise them for the life I wanted, but to raise them for the life that God wanted. And friends, what I'm here to tell you is that it changed my dad's life and changed his parenting when he got a better why. And if you ever stop to consider that what might radically alter everything about the way you feel about your context, your environment, your current situations, your pressures, 
Or it's not of the circumstances of your life or the person or people in your life would change. But if about every relationship in our family, we got for ourselves a better why. Because this is what the Bible says. The Bible says that the seed of God's Word is like a seed that fell into the ground. And around that seed, the devil sows a whole lot of other seeds that grow up and attempt to choke it. And this is what he described the choking influences that come around the seed of destiny in your life. Worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things. Put every marriage destroying influence into three categories. I think these are aptly it. Worries of this life. When you are just stressed out, career-oriented, pressure-oriented, goal-oriented, when the worries of this life, when the deceitfulness of wealth, just money, 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 the almighty dollar, when, when the desire for other things, other people, other relationships, other circumstances, they choke that seed and stop it from being fruitful. And God said, if you want to change your life, then pull out the weeds so you can see the seeds. Pull out all the other stuff so you can come back to what's central. I think we could change our marriages, not by anybody's actions changing, not by any habits changing, not by anything altering, but by us just coming back to this one question, why? Why? I think we could change our families if we discovered a better why. And I certainly know that we could change our lives if the why of our lives got a whole lot clearer. And I wanna put it to everybody in this auditorium that what we need in everything that we are doing is a clearer and a better why. Because when the why is clear, when the why is clear, the what looks different. When the why is clear, the what gets a lot easier. When the why is clear, everything becomes easier. And let me finish again by saying it for the second or third time this morning. We serve the God who has a why. We're not, we're not coming to a God who's gonna leave you alone if you need a better why. We're coming to the God who has a why for each and every one of us. If you pray, He'll answer. If you're looking for a reason, God will give it to you. Come on, God won't, God won't get our back when we're trying to check out on, on things, but He will give us, He will give us a clearer and a better sense of why. As the band come and join me on stage, let me tell you the story and then we're done. One of my favorite stories, I've told the story before. If you've been around for Arise for a while, you've heard it, but hear it again, because it's a really good one. <laughs> Billy Graham, who's gotta be one of the greatest Christians of the last 100 years, 150 years, was interviewed on television once by an interviewer who was trying to push all of the Christian boxes. And it was a long time ago, 20, 30 years ago, so the box that she was pushing on in this particular moment was the box of divorce. She kind of, you know how they do, they back, they back a moral leader who does believe in things passionately into a corner. And Billy Graham said in the interview, I believe that divorce is wrong. And the interviewer jumped on it. She's like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Are you trying to tell me that you're loving God? You're loving God who came to give us life. It's gonna make somebody live the entirety of their lives in a marriage that has no love in it. Are you trying to say that that's the will of God? That we could live in a horrible, loveless marriage for the rest of our days on this planet? Is that God's will for us? This is awkward pause. And then Billy Graham just looks at her and on live television all across the world, he said, if I wake up tomorrow morning and I'm out of love with my wife, I will get out of my bed only to fall on my knees and I won't get up again until I am in love with her. I just need you to know, you're not in the search for why alone. We serve the God who said, I have a plan for your life. I have a purpose for you. There is a reason why you're here. And if anybody here is saying, I need a why, I can tell you, God has one. Come on, if you believe that, could you praise your God together this morning?